Should your next portable computer be an iPad or a MacBook? Now on paper, this should be an easy choice, but the reality, well, it's a bit more complicated. Believe it or not, it's been almost 15 years since the first generation iPad was released. And in that time, we've reached a really interesting point in tech history where it's perfectly feasible that you could spend the same amount of money on an iPad as you could on a new MacBook. Both of these are portable, insanely powerful devices. And I've been really interested to see more and more people seem to be turning to iPads lately instead of a dedicated computer in a lot of contexts. In this video, we'll take a look at whether your next device should be an iPad or a MacBook, we'll explore the benefits and limitations of each one for different use cases, and I'll also cover the biggest trap that most buyers fall into when they're trying to make a decision between these two devices. But before we get into that, let's talk about the elephant in the room and its videos that look like this. I don't know about you, but my feed is full of these videos that are about whether an iPad can replace a MacBook. And I always think that this is one of those situations where reviewers were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. I just don't understand why anyone would attempt this kind of comparison because both devices are clearly designed for completely different types of user. It'd be a bit like asking, can I replace a pair of scissors with a piece of paper? Well, Apple are very unlikely to make a pair of scissors that you can write on or a piece of paper that you can use to cut something with, but you can use them both as tools separately or even together. And that's, of course, exactly what Apple want. How could you make that decision? And one way is just to think about price. And actually, that's not as easy or objective as it might sound. And that's partly because of the big trap that Apple have set for you here. Let's take an example. You've got a thousand crispy dollars to spend on a new device. Well, Apple's top of the range MacBook Pros, they're definitely out of the running for now. Even in the refurbed area, it's just not happening. You're gonna be way over budget if you want a brand new machine. You can actually spend upwards of $7,000 if you start going crazy with the specs on one of these. Now, a budget of a grand and though that will get you last year's 13 inch MacBook Air powered by the M2 processor, or if you can find an extra $99 behind the sofa, you can grab this year's brand new MacBook Air M3. Happy days. iPad wise, with that budget, you could almost buy three of the regular 10th gen iPads or a couple of iPad minis, but neither of these are really a viable comparison to a MacBook at all. So you're probably gonna be looking at the iPad Air, which is 599 for the 11 inch version or 799 for the 13 inch model. You could maybe even stretch to the iPad Pro, which won't quite get you to the 13 inch version, but will just buy you the new M4 11 inch model. So for a decent budget, that'll get you either a brand brand new MacBook Air or an iPad Air or a base spec iPad Pro. So far, so good, right? But it's not quite as simple as that. You see, if you buy any of these iPads and you're wanting to get pretty much anything done that isn't just browsing the internet, you're gonna need some other stuff. Quick side note, if you're buying an iPad to browse the internet and watch Netflix, and I know lots of people would do this, just grab the cheapest one you can, even if it's the 10th gen iPad. Anything else is gonna be complete overkill and don't let anyone else tell you otherwise. In terms of that stuff that you'll need, the Apple Pencil, for example, is a great tool for drawing and taking notes, even making amazing digital art, but you will be spending an extra 80 to $130 on that, depending on which one you need. Then there's some sort of protection, maybe a folio case, call that another 50 to $70. And then if you're typing anything more than a text message, you're gonna need a keyboard, which could take you all the way up to $200, maybe a bit more. And this is the trap. Once you've fallen into iPad territory, you're gonna be needing to buy accessories for different use cases and it will start to get expensive. So suddenly, all we can afford for our budget is actually just the smaller 11 inch iPad Air with maybe a keyboard and maybe the pencil included. And at that price, you might start daydreaming about all the extra stuff you could do with one of those shiny MacBook Airs with a screen that's two inches bigger. Hmm. So rather than use price as our guide, let's take a look at some typical tasks and see which device is best suited to them. Now, if you can isolate which ones apply to your typical use case, hopefully that should help you make a decision or at least let you shortlist from the six different iPad models and four models of MacBooks that are currently available. And let's start with general life admin. I'm talking about browsing websites, getting your online banking done, managing calendars, making a meal planning list for the week, that kind of thing. 
And when it comes to either device, they will let you get all of this stuff done really quickly and without much fuss. The question you probably want to be asking here is how much fine control do you want over those things? Let me just give you an example. So let's say you're shopping for a birthday present. Now on a Mac, you might have a couple of browser tabs open and maybe some kind of note taken app so that you can grab ideas and perhaps keep track of spending in a spreadsheet. You'd be able to do that really easily, pretty much out of the box using a MacBook. Now on an iPad, on the other hand, you're gonna have a really nice experience browsing those websites, but if you wanna start saving stuff to a notes app or copying, pasting information to any other location, you're gonna be doing quite a lot of app switching and you'll find that probably will slow you down quite a bit. You could try features like split screen or stage manager, but you'll probably find that you'll still struggle to see multiple things on a screen at any one time. Now, the way that the iPad software works just isn't designed to have multiple apps open at once. Even if you hook this up to a display and connect a keyboard and mouse, you're gonna still find yourself limited by the way iPadOS has been set up. So yeah, I'm gonna give this round to the Mac. Now, depending on your preferences, you might wanna use your device to stream TV shows and movies, maybe the odd YouTube video from your favorite hat-wearing tech channel, or perhaps you're into audiobooks and podcasts and magazines and maybe even Kindle-style eBooks. As a consumption device, the MacBook will let you do some of those things pretty well. My MacBook Pro, for example, has an incredible display with a stunning set of speakers, and I frequently use this to watch high-quality films on this big, 14 inch screen with no problems at all. However, the form factor doesn't mean that I've always got the keyboard and trackpad with me, which takes up quite a bit of space. So if I'm cooking dinner, for example, or sitting in bed, it's not the most comfortable or easy size and weight to have with me. Now the iPad, on the other hand, is so versatile for this use case. And as a media consumption device, it runs rings around pretty much anything else. It's always on, so I can easily fire up YouTube, Disney Plus, or any of my favorite streaming apps, and then just prop it up wherever it needs to be. Also, and this is a really important distinction, most of these apps let me download content to my iPad to watch without a connection, which is far harder to do on a laptop. And the screen, particularly the tandem OLED screen on the new M4 edition iPad Pros, it's astonishingly bright. It's got tons of contrast, even with this paper-like screen protector on. And it's a real joy to watch content on at the highest resolution I can get hold of. You can also have podcasts and audiobooks streaming, no problem at all, and there are dedicated dedicated apps for reading magazines, books, and pretty much any kind of content you can think of. And it's literally at your fingertips. These iPads are now so light that even this 11 inch version is comfortable to hold in one hand for extended periods without any issue. So if you're reading a book, maybe highlighting some passages and making notes, it's a really cool way to digest this kind of content. So this round easily goes to the iPad. It's an absolute no brainer when it comes to consuming whatever you wanna consume. Let's have a look at productivity work. And by this, I mean going beyond the kind of tasks that you do around the home and thinking about work activities, staying organized, and maybe even managing a team or a business. And this is where things start to get a bit more complicated because the one I would recommend here kind of depends on your particular use case and also the particular apps that you need to get stuff done. As an example, if you work for yourself and you've got complete control over what apps you like to use to be productive, there's absolutely tons of included software on Apple devices that work brilliantly. I'm talking about things like Apple Notes, Mail, Freeform, Keynote, there's loads more. And these all work brilliantly regardless of the device that you're using. But in work mode, not everyone gets that choice and the vast majority of people will find themselves locked into either the Google suite of apps or maybe even Microsoft when they're working. If that is you, by the way, thoughts and prayers. <laughs> Both Macs and iPads have native Google and Microsoft apps available, but they are not all created equally. And again, depending on your particular workflows, you might start finding problems with the iPad user experience if you're finding that you need to hop between apps regularly to get your work done. So in my case, for example, I might be running a Zoom call where I need to share my screen and then also see what's going on in the chat. And that exact workflow means I have to use a MacBook. It just wouldn't be possible on any iPad, no matter how much money I threw at it. So on the other hand, if my particular brand of productivity was coding, I'd probably be using something like Xcode. Now this also doesn't work on an iPad yet, but you can download other apps that will let you work on writing and testing code out. On the other, other hand, your particular version of productivity, particularly if you're a team manager, might just be responding to emails, 
signing documents and joining tons of meetings every day without ever needing to present stuff. And actually, for that kind of productivity, there's no reason at all why you couldn't use an iPad. I'm gonna give points to both devices here with a special mention going to just how much you can get done on an iPad these days. But if you're all about productivity power use, I'm talking multiple screens, multiple windows open all the time, yeah, you probably are gonna be needing a Mac to get that stuff done. This is also a pretty broad term, but tends to be how people describe their activities if they're responsible for any kind of creative output. And Apple as a brand is very much geared towards the creative industry, whether that's professional audio recording, video content creation, or even detailed design work. Now, each of these different use cases tend to come with specialist software and require powerful hardware to run them smoothly. So for example, when I'm making these videos, I record in some of the highest resolution possible and I need my device to move around massive files. Sometimes they're all stacked on top of one another before I'm able to render it to a timeline and then start applying what you might call the creative treatment. That's, That's the sort of thing that makes something go from looking and sounding like this, straight from my camera, to looking and sounding a bit more like this. And this is when we get to the challenge of the word pro. Now, Apple sell both hardware and software with the word pro in the title. And at this point, we have the iPhone Pro, MacBook Pros, Mac Pros, iPad Pros, Pro Display XDR, and most recently, Apple Vision Pro and the Apple Pencil Pro. Coincidentally, these are also their most expensive devices. And then to support them, we've got software like Logic Pro and Final Cut Pro. Come to think of it, even though it's not made by Apple, we also have Procreate. Now, all of this hints that Apple really want creative professionals to be considering these Pro labeled devices first, if you're gonna be doing work a bit like this. But is that fair? Well, yeah, it kind of is. If you're a professional sound engineer or video content creator, you will be able to get by. In fact, there's a great productivity creator called Jill who edits all her videos on an iPad Pro and her content is fab. I'm gonna leave a link to her channel just down there if you wanna check it out. But the difference here is that she started creating content on an iPad and hasn't known anything else. I think for people who are used to the full unbridled access of a desktop version of Final Cut Pro, they will likely feel hampered by things like not being able to apply your favorite plugins and effects, and just generally feel a bit handcuffed by having the power of an M series chip, but without the software to back it up. That is the biggest challenge that Apple needs to overcome. And the exception here is for creative design work. And yeah, you don't need a MacBook Pro to get some awesome digital art produced. You don't even need an iPad Pro as the latest iPad Air models are really powerful and compatible with both the new Apple Pencil Pro plus the cheaper USB-C Apple Pencil. If you pick up the 13 inch iPad Air and one of these, along with a cheeky $13 Procreate purchase in the App Store, you can have a nice big canvas to be able to create all sorts. And it's like having a complete art studio right there in your iPad. Points wise, this is really difficult to score because it massively depends on how you define creative work and what kind of apps you need to get things done. I would say though, unless you're a digital artist, look at MacBooks first and then look at iPads to see if you can get the same task done. Let's start rounding this up and I've got three big thoughts after looking at this comparison. Number one, the big challenge with iPads is left over from the very first model in that they are this gorgeous piece of magical glass that appear to be mainly designed for the consumption of content and not for producing content. They've come a really long way in the last 15 years, but it's still hard to get away from that simple distinction, which is sadly emphasized by the way that iPadOS is designed. If you want basic computing needs or something to use temporarily whilst on a business trip to avoid having to lug around a heavy laptop and your primary use case for your device is consumption, get an iPad with some accessories and you'll be super happy. For most other cases, yeah, take a look at the MacBooks, especially the MacBook Air, which in my view is a phenomenal portable computer that most users probably should buy and it'll last you for years. At number two, if I had to sum this entire video up, there's probably just one question you need to ask. Do you need a device that lets you draw, paint or write? If the answer is yes, buy an Apple Pencil, buy an iPad. There's no equivalent to that kind of interface on a Mac, whereas accessories like the Magic Keyboard will make your iPad feel and behave in a very similar way to a laptop, as well as being able to interact with your fingers 
or a pencil. Number three, and this is a thought rather than a recommendation, so just go easy with me on this one. I do think there is a sweet spot which involves having both devices. Now, the main problem Apple have is that when you buy one of these products, they're going to last you for years, especially anything with Apple silicon chip in. It doesn't need to be this year's latest and greatest models, but if you can afford to buy both of them, look at refurbished, secondhand, eBay, or even just the base models, or consider getting an iPad for portable use, maybe combined with one of Apple's desktop machines like the Mac Studio, the Mac Mini, or the iMac, and you will be covering yourself for pretty much all eventualities. And then with the beauty of the Apple ecosystem, yeah, you can take a shot if you're thinking that I might mention that at some point. The beauty of that is that it just makes it so easy to flow between these devices if you're fortunate enough to be able to have both in your setup. If you've reached this part of the video and you've come to the conclusion that you need to buy an iPad, the next problem you'll probably be facing is which one you should be getting. But good news, I put together a really easy guide to help you find which one is best for you with a thorough rundown of the pros and cons of each of the latest models. And that is all over here when you're ready. See you next time, folks.